So, um, for now, it's over to Navino. Yeah. Okay. Well, Nav, Nav is the short Nav, name, so fine. Yeah, All right. So, name. there Speaking you go. Weird languages. My name is All Sanskrit, right. so it's not kind of like your average everyday name. Um, first thing to explain as well is I'm not John Cummings, who was actually listed, uh, much as I'd love to be John. He's such a great guy. Uh, but he's not, he could make it, so I'm sort of standing in. It was supposed to be both of us. Um, so really what I want to go over is a little bit about our work, uh, you know, being the, the, you know, the International Year of Indigenous Languages. We've been trying to sort of switch some of our focus towards language data. Um, a little bit of context, John is the Wikimedian in residence at UNESCO. Uh, and so I work with John and, uh, and also Sean who's in the room here. Um, basically, me and Sean are sort of more on the data side of things. John does kind of finding out where the data is and trying to point point stuff to us. Uh, often it's just, you know, kind of, you know, stuff that's not usable or, you know, isn't really right license-wise and stuff like that, but he's just trying to root out everything he can and we try and use it where we can. Uh, so that's my Twitter handle there, uh, my full name. Um, so basically their main sort of goal, you know, with this, with this international year uh, of indigenous languages is, is about raising awareness and sort of, you know, really, Kind of treasuring these the, the, these languages as a sort of like you know a real cultural gem that we need to sort of protect and look afterwards and raising awareness is one of the main things that we need to do you know a lot of the talks today have already uh, you know been talking about the way that they sort of die out if people aren't aware of them and, and knowing and knowing knowing that it's there knowing how to learn uh, you know and what they need to learn um, so I'll just kind of take you through um, one of the issues we were thinking about with this is. Uh, so they've got all these language experts. There's all these experts in all these different fields. But, but how, how can we sort of get hold of their expertise and, and use that to sort of improve? Wikidata is what we're looking at, but by sort of extension, that means Wikipedia and everything else, because once you've got something well covered in Wikidata, it means you've got the tool you need to go and link off and find missing content. You know, what, what's a missing article? about something that's around me or what's a missing article about a really important language uh, that should be should be written about. So it's kind of a starting point. Uh, so we're trying to work on processes and ways that we can get external experts to come in, even though they don't really understand Wikidata and how it works. So it's kind of that marriage between the expert and the, uh, the Wikidata and, uh, community member. <laughs> So the first step for our, for our importing is like, how are we going to do it in a structural way? And so we kind of think about this as sort of like building a base to work from. Uh, so the main thing we've been doing is trying to say, okay, we, we want data from all these different places and we want to sort of marry it together in Wikidata in a nice unified and clean way without sort of creating mess and chaos. Um, so the best way to sort of do this normally, no matter what data set it is, uh, if you have identifiers, unique identifiers available, uh, that's something that we can actually use as our sort of main reference point to identify each individual thing. So what we really need to do is marry up those identifiers to Wikidata items so we know that they mean the same thing, uh, commonly referred to as matching. Um, so ISO 6933 codes are basically intended to give us a unique code for every known individual language, excluding language groups. Um, it's a little bit messy. I mean, when I started learning about this, if you go and if you want to have a good laugh, try and read the Wikipedia article on the 693 codes in general, and you've got this incredible table of complexity about how they all interact with the 6931 codes, the 6932s, the 6933s, and the fives. <laughs> and, uh, it's quite a complicated situation. You can see that it's not also perfect. There's still a lot of work in progress. Uh, but at the moment, it's one of the most widely used sort of identifiers, and it's what we should be basing it all on. Um, so, you know, most languages will have this code. Um, our strategy is make, let's make sure that the ISO codes are really good in Wikidata. And once we know that they are, you know, we know, you know, ENG is for English or whatever. Uh, we can then sort of use that as a base for importing data from other places. You know, we can say, great, that's the ISO code that we know. And straight away, we've got a unique match. And we can say, great, they've got the number of speakers over time. So I can pull that in. Uh, so getting the ISO 6933 code sorted was one of the most important things. Um, <clears throat> basing it on unique identifiers is also really important for tracking changes and just makes your life a lot easier when things have changed. You can go and look look for these IDs rather than sort of go and just look randomly for things that have then just disappeared and you might have to rematch everything all over again. 
so IDs is a really important way to do this. Um, uh, so the second aspect to it is, is how do you track it and how do you sort of track discussion with experts? How do you pull in their expertise? Um, so you need to have a sort of a central place to talk about it. Um, so this is the sort of thing that me and John got going, which was, uh, you know, uh, a mechanism, this data of data set imports pages. Uh, it's sort of like a hub where any data import that you're doing can be, you know, tracked and recorded. You can discuss it with other people. You can ask for help. Um, we've kind of got it broken down to these different topics, but if you follow that link, you'll see that, you know, it's quite new. There's not many data sets in there yet, but it's, it, and it's, you know, it's not a perfect solution. Uh, it's maybe not even a good solution, to be quite honest, but it's, it's the right idea. It's the idea that you have a centralized hub for each import of data from an external data set. Um, so we've got a few in there from UNESCO and there's lots of other people. Uh, there's quite a few in progress ones there if you click through and see. Um, and so crucially on that, you know, it does also, you know, prevent other people from duplicating work if they're looking at this data import hub. So once it's more widely used, you could go in and say, look, I'm thinking about doing this. Oh no, someone's already doing it. We don't have to work with it. So uh, this is one of the coolest uh, data sets we worked on with languages initially because it's UNESCO related. And so it's quite easy for John to use his connections to get hold of, uh, of this data. Uh, so the Atlas of the World's Languages in Danger, it's basically like, you know, it's this expert written database of languages categorized in their severity of their endangerment. Uh, so quite an important resource. Um, and it sort of doesn't completely marry up with all the ISO lists. So there's some things that, is, that are not covered on the ISO dialects but are actually covered here. So it's quite an important one for us to look at. Uh, and it sort of really shows the benefits of asking the experts for their help and getting that data coming in from there. Uh, so that's like one of the outputs of us importing this data. And it's a little bit incomplete because we're basing this on the ones that we also have coordinate locations for. So there's about 900 or so languages here, but there's, there's 2,600 or so 2,200 in the actual database. Uh, if you click through on that query, which I won't do now on the live, you can sort of toggle these on and off to filter them. Uh, and because there is a lot of missing coordinates, we can't fully rely on this just yet. It's not like, you know, we can see patterns, you know, interesting patterns about where they are, but we can't sort of, we can't sort of, in, can, you know, confirm that where there's no dots that, you know, there, there shouldn't be. So it's still a work in progress, but it goes to show what you can do when you start linking it up. These kind of queries are really easy to make. So yeah, I encourage you to click through on those and have a little look around. It's really good fun. And if you click on any one of the dots, it will tell you what the language is and, uh, and uh, where it is. Uh, so it's important just to go over some of the issues that we had. Um, the worst of all was really incorrect matching right at the beginning, like when you're trying to sort of go through. Sometimes there's some manual work involved. There are tools to help with this. Uh, but basically, we ended up in a situation where people were going, oh, that looks pretty much like the right language. Yeah, that's a good match. And the problem was they were looking at a dialect or some other thing, and it wasn't a perfect match. We then go and import lots of data. And you get all of these problems trickling over time that are happening. You know, we're finding out things were wrong in the matching, so the data's wrong, it's getting fixed, but then it's not being fixed in the source matching catalog that you were using, and it gets very messy to reconcile. Uh, so the tip is really put all of your effort into that matching phase, make sure it's as perfect as you can, as you can make it. And if you find something is not quite the right concept, it's a, it's a a dialect of a language or it's a slightly different concept, then you need to make a new item for it and say, look, there wasn't a match. We need a new one for it. Uh, so that's pretty important. Uh, next thing was a bit more of a generic one on Wikidata, just general inconsistent modeling. And it's just where everyone's got their own idea about how it should work and how we should link things up. And of course, you end up with differences in the same domain, which is quite difficult to reconcile uh, and you need to somehow try and find out, you know, what, what do we all agree is the best way of doing it? And there's at the moment not an easy process for where do you do that? How do people find out if you have agreed something? It's quite a difficult process. Um, so there's, it's an issue, but uh, it's kind of mitigated by, by using a data import page so you can at least discuss it and know you can point someone to the right place. Um, and there's a newly released sort of uh, feature of Wikidata, which is using the, the, the concept of shape expressions, which is a sort of a W3C standard of way of modeling sort of data. Uh, and then we can sort of 
getting to the point where we can start analyzing on mass where say languages that don't fit with the usual data model that we think they should be and then you can kind of easily root out the uh, the, the, the issues and the outliers. Um, crucial point here is that because things are changing over time, it's made certain data partners quite reluctant to reuse the visualizations and the output because they just don't trust it. Uh, they, they, they're, they're worried that it's not going to be the accurate reflection of the data that we've actually imported. Um, there's, again, there are things coming that are sort of making this a bit easier. Sign statements is, is one concept that's coming up, which is like, somehow putting a sort of stamp on it to say this is definitely good data, the, the source has agreed to it. Um, and that, that, that discussion is ongoing right now. So um, let's have a look. So yeah, this is our other major issue that came up and it's, it comes up quite a lot. It's just that it's not easy to evaluate the impact. Uh, on Wikipedia, yeah. it's like you can say, look, you, you, you gave us this, this text and then it was viewed like 10 million times last month or, or whatever. Uh, same with images. When people upload images, you can say, well, that's been viewed all these times or, you know, had so many downloads and views of it. Um, with the data, it's much harder, um, partly because English Wikipedia is so like this about Wikidata. They don't want to integrate that data in. So that would be a nice way of doing it because then you could say, look, the data is, is written on this information box on a Wikipedia article. And then you could say it had X many views and then, you know, get some exposure. But it's an ongoing issue, um, um, and basically this, we need some way to sort of really showcase the impact and why is it worth them going through all this time and energy and potentially risk, because it will involve opening up their data, you know, CC0 data. Uh, you need to have a really compelling reason why they want to do it and why it's going to be good for their organization, and that's one of the things that's kind of missing a little bit. Um, so uh, minority language Wikipedia is a great for this, actually, because they're really leading the way. They're the ones that are kind of saying, yeah, let's embrace Wikidata, let's use it for generating our lists, let's reduce our workload and take all this amazing automatic stuff. Uh, so what's the point in all this? Why do we want all this lovely data to be imported and, and sorted out? Um, so, uh, you know, once you've got uh, all of this data covered in Wikidata, it opens up these, I mean, it's kind of just listed a few loose things there, but these are all quite important, you know, finding automated to-do lists to find out where articles are missing, say in your local area or, or, or broader languages that need to have articles written about them. Linking to external data sets is one of the, the most magic things about Wikidata, that you end up with a hub for this language, say, that then leads you off to every other resource you might ever want. You know, it's got all the identifiers for the Glottolog, UNESCO endangered languages and anything else that you might want that we've got recorded. And by and large, Wikidata has an amazing collection of, of identifiers for other external sources. So this is a really, really, really powerful part of it. Uh, checking the differences. So, you know, we, we might just be finding errors in the source data, but if we're finding out UNESCO thinks something's severely endangered, but Glottolog thinks it's, it's fine and dandy, then we know there's something wrong and we can find out who do we contact, who is wrong, investigate further. Sometimes it might be deviations because of cultural differences and thoughts about things. So there's something interesting to find out there. But in any case, the more of them we link in, the more we can do this automated comparison between them, which is incredibly powerful. Uh, creating visualizations is one of the most beautiful things about Wikidata because it's so easy. You know, once you've got the data in there, they've, they've got all these incredible tools like ready to go for making graphs and charts and bubble charts and timelines and maps and all this stuff. So, you know, huge benefit there. And one of the lovely things is that, <clears throat> excuse me, that you sort of, um, you end up combining it with all the rest of the knowledge about the world. It's not in a silo anymore where we've got some language data on its own. We're actually combining it with the rest of the world's knowledge. Uh, some trivial examples we came up with before, but pretty cool. You know, once you've got the languages, well, let's find living people who speak a vulnerable language or an endangered language. Um, so I've got the beginning of these query results here, but the link there will actually show you the full list. That was about 2,160 people in Wikidata who speak a vulnerable language. Um, books written in vulnerable languages, and the same would go for, sorry, I didn't actually mean to click there. Um, see, that's okay. Uh, so this is the kind of thing that you can do because you're then linking it with all these other concepts and topics. So, you know, how does it relate to countries? All of this kind of wonderful stuff, um, which is really the magic of Wikidata, having it all in one place. 
Uh, this is just a really nice one to show. This is a, actually doesn't look so clear until you kind of click through on the, on the, on the query link here. Uh, but this is a tree map showing all of the categories from UNESCO of endangerment. And in each one of these sections, it shows you the counts of, of, of each, uh, you know, the, the counts of how many of those languages in that category there are in each country. So, for example, we can look at, say, critically endangered and see that United States here is actually surprisingly, according to this list and the data being correct, uh, is actually, um, you know, <laughs> the, the, the highest in the list, which I wouldn't have guessed. Again, here you've got kind of India, Brazil, um, you know, but. If you click on this, you can actually click on one of these squares and it will zoom you into it. Um, I actually had an even cooler one where you had like consonants into countries and then you zoomed in further. But it had a funny little bug, which I need to report to the query service, I think. Or it was a bug in my brain. And I was <laughs> completely wrong, one or the other. Uh, but that's a really cool example of like, you know, hey, let's, let's explore this data a bit further. Uh, so what, where do we go from here? Uh, I mean, basically, you know, the possibilities are endless, but there's more work to be done, a lot more work to be done on clarifying and sort of uh, consolidating the data, making sure it's rock solid. Because as you can see, once you feel like you can rely on it, you can really start to find out interesting things, and, uh, research things, do, do amazing things. Uh, here's just a little sample of some of the amazing stuff we really want to do. Uh, you know, uh, definitely increase use on Wikipedia's. I'm talking about English Wikipedia here because it's you know data is generally getting used all over the place on small Wikipedias. Um, fill in articles about little known languages where you know to help spread awareness um, and um, and you know basically just generally generally fill in the gaps in Wikipedia that we then can identify because the Wikidata side of it is is covered. Um, Import a lot more data based on these matching ISO 6393 codes, which we know are pretty good now. We've done a lot of error checking on them. You know, they're not going to be perfect, but by and large, if you take a thousand languages of ISO 6393 codes, you're going to be finding the right languages. Almost all of them are going to be the correct concept on Wikidata at the moment. There's about 8,000 of them right now. Um, so that means that we can just pull any other data source that's got ISO code and other data that we would like and compatible license, we can just pull it in without any complicated matching and all of that stuff. It's, it's an automatic process. Um, creating a, con a consistent structure for mapping the connections between languages and groups of languages. This is probably one of the most messy bits in Wikidata at the moment. And I have to say, I'm not language expert enough to really have delved into it and understand what's even wrong with it, except that you can see certain bits where there's, you know, loops that are going round and incorrect sort of structural look at it. But I've got a query on the next page that it illustrates sort of, uh, you know, why that's something that's very important. Uh, the Glottolog seems to be an amazing resource for this. I hope I'm saying that correctly, but uh, they've really got an incredible sort of uh, layer on language is where it's sort of like an expandable tree of, you know, starting in your Celtic languages and then opening that up to get all the, all the different Celtic languages and then opening those up to get different dialects, uh, you know, and this is a really powerful thing. I, I want to see Wikidata just as, uh, just as complete so you can really explore the tree of languages and find out where things come from. I mean, especially now that we've got lexemes and, you know, basically sort of, uh, you know, data about words themselves coming into Wikidata. If we then have the roots of the languages very well mapped as well, the, the sorts of things that you could infer about languages would be fascinating. Uh, so, um, and then improving the linkages between languages and, and geographic locations where they're spoken. Uh, so we've kind of got quite good coverage. A lot of work has been done already, but I've noticed for UNESCO, we've only got like 900 of those languages have a sort of direct place associated out of 2,200. So there's more to be done on certain subsets of the data. Uh, just to call, excuse the little graph having terrible access at the bottom, but that's, um, that's just like one of the things we could do if we got number of speakers as well covered it is, as it is in Welsh, we could sort of start seeing how they're changing over time and start, you know, predicting and seeing, okay, which languages are in more trouble than others. But with Welsh, it's a great trend because you can see there was a problem and it seems to have resolved itself. It seems like we're finally starting to move the other way. Uh, obviously, the more data points we can get in here, the more smoothly we, you know, we can rely on this. And of course, uh, like you're saying for something like Cornish, you know, this is problematic because you're not even sure uh, exactly how many we've got. And if you've got a small number, it's quite difficult. But the best estimates we do have should be in there. That's what I feel like. And whatever we can get over time is even more interesting because we get these graphs 
Um, uh, and just a last little query, just an exciting little query. I always love these graphs. Uh, and just to show what we could do if we did have the structure of the languages really well covered. Um, so this, you'll see in the middle there, is Celtic languages, which actually this particular query that I've made, it just starts at Celtic languages and looks for all of the subclass languages. Uh, and you can see we go into these different parts and we've got Cornish appearing there. Uh, we've got Breton there. We've got all kinds of other languages and dialects, but you can see it's branching out from that one into its dialects. Uh, it's not going to be perfect. I think if a language expert had a look at this, they'd probably be going, okay, that looks great. Oh, no, what on earth is that? Oh, why does that one link in there? So I feel like these visualizations are a crucial part of getting experts to actually look on these, but look at these and find errors, uh, which is going to involve looking at your specific subject area. Um, the tools that I've used are all linked there. So that th th this is a great little tool because you don't need to know about queries to write this. It's, it's quite easy, you know. Um, but basically, that's the direction we want to go, completely structured, completely covered to the best of our knowledge, and with loads and loads of data from different sources all pulled into one place uh, and available for everyone to use. Um, that's pretty much it. Yeah. OK, well, thank you. I think if there's any time for questions, I'm not sure, but it's... Uh... Yeah, it's okay. yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll let you on top of that in the meantime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, if there are any questions, uh, happy to. Uh, has like anybody got a question well. for Nav? Yes. Yeah, Gareth, Gareth. 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 Uh, I actually don't know what the meaning behind that was. That's John's department understanding it. I just deal with the data he gives me and just put it in. But I, does anyone here know the answer to that question? Like UNESCO does have their two diff different, different. Uh... We used to be extinct, mm. and now we're only critically endangered. <laughs> there you go. It's progress. <laughs> extinct is not a one-way thing. You know, you can come back from the brink. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'll have to look into that. It's never occurred to me when I was looking at those visualizations. It's a pretty obvious question, but yeah, sorry, no good answer at the moment. Because obviously, even more common usage. <laughs> Extinct is death of a death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would presume that was the direction it was going, but how do they delineate? There must be a reason behind it, yeah, I'm sure. A lot of the time they have, um, a lot of the time there's also this kind of issue about how do you classify it, how do different people classify it, and it comes up a lot in that particular issue because they all have slightly differing views on it. Uh, and also, what do you mean by a new language at all? Where there's a lot of issues about how do you how do you really check all the criteria that mean you deserve to be a new language rather than just a kind of yeah, it's all the figures. <laughs> the extinct language is a language that no longer has any speakers, especially if the language has no living descendants. In contrast, a dead language is no one uh, one that no longer the native language of any community. There you no go. There you go. So it's so you say right. Okay. There you go. You've done something new. That's uh, even if it's still a new so that Latin. is a dead language. Yeah. Mm. Yes, but because the others have well, a large number of speakers for a dead language in Latin America, especially. <laughs> well, there you go. That's that's what. Oh, clearly, in that definition, you certainly can have a, a lot of speakers of a dead language. Uh, and so, uh, yeah. Well, there you go. There you go. That's the answer. Thank you very much, Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the floor, I'm, uh, uh -huh. but uh, that, I think right. uh, we'll, we'll leave it there with one question. Thank you very much. All right, cheers. Thanks, Simon. Yes, take your lot. Um, okay, thank you for that. So next up, we've got 